Welcome back to Your Go Wild. In this episode, we head to Longreach and visit the Qantas Museum and Stockman Hall of Fame. But first, we need to get a much needed photo of us and the MDC with the iconic Winton sign. Whilst we were there, we bumped into a couple driving their old MG Spirit doing a lap of Australia. And he was very keen to chat as he has an old 1954 MG midget back at home. So, morning. So, um, we have just left Winton.
walking back from the pub and all the cows had escaped when they the field and we had to drive muscle them up. One thing we really loved about Longreach and Winton, they have plenty of places in town for caravans and campers to park. Okay, good everybody, my name is Lockie Costa, I'm a Third generation stockman. We work together. I'm sure we'll get these feet cleaned out. So um, just see every good. There we go. All right. Now don't wriggle around. Listen. Don't wriggle. We haven't got a lot of time for this. Now, what I'm going to do is just pop you up here. Whoop, there we go. All right. Now that'll be a lot easier on my back. There we go. Which foot first, mate? Oh, okay. The rocks out of there. There we go. Other push. Okay. There we go. That's looking a lot better there now. Uh, it's a bit grubby, but isn't he? Listen, just give me a sec, I'll just quickly grab a brush. I'll give him a quick uh, quick tidy up with the brush. I'll give this a go. <laughs> Behind the ears get right oh no. <laughs> now I've broke the wife's good broom. God, that's no good at all. Look at that. How's she gonna get home now? <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'll give you tidy up. I'll give this a go. This is a Trying to tell me that he doesn't want the uh, he's making a move. Yeah. Um, all right, well, as I said earlier, I like to work with the horses. So if Ernie doesn't want the saddle on, well, so be it, we won't worry about the saddle. But I can't just let my horse get away with that, because that would be spoiling my horse. So I'll still ride Ernie around, and I'll just ride him bareback. So this is good, we make good boy. So, here we go. Uh oh, no, Ernie! Oh. <laughs> Oh, this is no Ernie, don't... All the way through the show was humour and information about being a stockman, but the best bit was for me was when the cattle dogs came out to muster the sheep, especially Ding, who looked a spit image of our golden Labrador summer. Okay. Go back. Daddy, go back. All right, now as these sheep come out, you'll see a line of sheep through them. All the yellow taggers, all the yellow merinos. That's what they would have been shearing around Longridge back in the day. Okay. The rumour has it back in 1872, when Gleason's Kelpie come about, that she was by a dingo. But it's the boot having to do with a dingo back then, so it was never really mentioned out loud. The University of New South Wales actually did a study on the Kelpie dogs as recently as the last two or three years, and they actually found a bit of dingo DNA in the Kelpies. So that's probably why you get that odd yellow pup come through. Now down in Castleton every year, they have a show on sale down there at an auction. Last year, here. The top dog at auction, 2021, a black and tan two-year-old dog smashed the record, making a bit over $30,000 for the one dog. Hell of a lot of money. But if you work it out over a period of time, you get 10 or 12 years out of a good dog, they front up fresh every Monday, don't have any RDOs, and you don't bring any super anyway, so <laughs> it can work out not too bad over a period of time. 
Well, I reckon we've got a pretty good argument here. There could be a bit of dingo in the Kelpie breed. We're going to bring Ding out here. We call him Ding. Here comes Ding. He's actually a purebred Kelpie. He's by a black and tan dog. He's out of a red and tan bitch. He's definitely thrown in the dingo colours there. He's got a lot of dingo pictures about him. Now, Ding's five years old. For the first two years of Ding's life, he spent in the backyard in Sydney as a pet. But as you can imagine, he got a bit too much to handle as a pet, so we brought him out here. Now, he virtually started working straight away. He would have had that natural instinct, didn't he, when he was six weeks old, six months old. He'll be there all his life. He loves to work the livestock, beautiful dog. Uh, become a great part of the team here. And his mother, in fact, throws a yellow pup every second or third litter. litter. It is amazing the time and effort he's put in to train all these animals. There can't be many cows willing to stand there whilst someone rides them and plays the guitar and sings. We are staying in Ilfracombe and all along the streets has historic machinery and open air buildings full of memorabilia. All the campsites in Longreach were busy so we decided to stay in Ilfracombe campsite and drive into town and it was a good choice as the campsite was fantastic and really friendly. The current owner at the time did happy hour and performed poetry, it was really fantastic. However it was up for sale at the time when we went. We did get to meet the new owners and they seemed really friendly. Well, it is quite amusing that Ilfracombe is quite a quiet place. There's no one really ever here. Yet, there's still a speed camera. And that guy's been sat there a while, waiting for someone to come past and speed. Bit of a waste of resources, I say, think I say. Look, let's see how many people actually drive down here. It's a busy road, you know. Oh, he turned off. The DC-3 started its life as a C-47 with the United States Army for Air Force in 1944, before becoming a Qantas Empire Airways aircraft and being converted to civilian DC-3 in 1948. The aircraft still has the large double C-47 style doors. A couple of other quick things about the aircraft that you may not know, um, unless you're really into planes and loving that sort of stuff. The nose cone on these aircraft is called the radar, because underneath that dome is the weather radar. The weather radar sends a beam 54 to 540 kilometres out in front of the aircraft, tells the pilots what the weather's doing in front of them. Hopefully they'll avoid all the real yucky stuff and get to them enough the nicest flight possible. Slightly behind that, you'll see those two lovely spearhead looking devices or pike head looking devices. There's two on this side, two on the other side. They're called the pitot tubes. They're essentially the speedometer for the plane. So the air goes through the nozzle at the front, change of air pressure, sends the message up to the flight deck, changes the needle on the flight deck, tells the pilot what speed they're doing. They have four of them uh, because they need to know what speed they're doing. So if one or even two get damaged some way, there's still got two more that can still tell them what they're doing. Just behind that, you'll see a little um, device that looks a bit like a hockey stick head or a putter head um, from a golf club. That's actually called the angle of attack vane. And that is a device that actually assists with the prevention of a stall of the aircraft. If the noise of the plane goes up too high, the air over and under the wing doesn't work effectively and the plane ends up going to what they call a stall, which is it basically falls out of the sky, which isn't a good thing to do. So what happens is, as the nose gets up to a certain point, those um, angle of attack planes will actually send a message into the flight deck to tell the pilot to bring the nose down so you don't get into that stall position. The Boeing 747 City of Bunbury was the first Qantas aircraft named after a WA town to mark the 150th anniversary of WA and Bunbury being declared city in 1979. During its work life, estimated the aircraft carried over 5.4 million passengers and flew over 82 million kilometers, either domestically between Sydney and Perth or internationally between Sydney and San Francisco. It is the only surviving Boeing 747-200 with Rolls-Royce engines. 
Inside the aircraft is the important black box. You can see as we walk down the plane how dated it is to modern day aircraft. But back in the day, this would have been state of the art and everyone shared the TV screen, if you were lucky. And you had to watch what the cabin crew selected. The Lockheed Super Constellation was operated by Qantas on the Kangaroo route between Sydney and London from 1958. It was originally built in the US in 1939 and was built for speed and the pressurized cabins meant it could fly above the weather making it a comfortable aircraft flying. The Constellation was the first aircraft that was enabled Qantas to establish and sustain long-range overseas air services in its own right. The first such trans-global service in world airline history and first to feature female flight hostesses. In November 1991, cars in Wollongong started what has to become a major restoration project. The biggest problem was getting volunteers to continually travel. The Boeing 707, built in US in 1950s, was the first jet of 13, a civilian jet aircraft registered in Australia and replaced the propeller-driven super constellations and half the flying time in, on Qantas overseas routes. It was so fast, passengers discovered jet lag for the first time. It was in service for many years before it operated as a private airline. If it could talk, it would have some amazing stories to tell. In 1981, an American firm decided to refurbish the aircraft to sell it to the Saudi market. The firm went to great lengths to make it as opulent as possible with chandeliers, teak timber, gold trim and white leather seats. But it was when it was inspected by the Saudi airline, it wasn't the $51 million price tag that was the problem. It was because they had used pigskin to cover the seats. A few months later, a Perth businessman purchased the magnificent lavish plane for an undisclosed price, nowhere near the original asking price, and the cold trims and leather seats were removed. It was chartered by the Jackson 5 for the Victory Tour in 1984. Later, Michael wanted to purchase the plane, but was unable to because of the US aviation rules due to noise levels. The only other 707 still in existence is owned by John Travolta, which has been donated to the Haas Museum down in Wollongong. The team are busy restoring the plane before it can be flown back to Wollongong. Inside the museum there are many smaller planes and has lots of history of aviation in the museum to look at and you can even try your hand at flying biplane simulator. When Qantas expanded its Cloncurry Charleville service to Brisbane in April 1929, it bought two new de Havilland Giant Moth aircrafts. The new aeroplane could carry eight passengers, but Qantas removed the front seats and replaced it with a toilet, making it there the first airline in Australia to be able to boast such convenience. Iris was the first purpose-designed airline used by Qantas in 1924 as a four-passenger aircraft. It was first to have a fully enclosed cabin which significantly improved passengers' comfort. The Catalina flying boat played an important role for Qantas during the 1950s. They enabled the airline service to remote villages in New Guinea and around the South Pacific where aerodromes hadn't yet been built. 
During the World War II, Qantas based five Catalinas in Perth and operated longest duration regular airline service non-stop for an average of 28 hours each way to Salon to carry VIP passengers and special mail and dispatches. It was known as the Double Sunrise Service and was a top secret operation through Japanese patrolled areas for the first 12 months and continued until 1945. The museum's Catalina was a fire bomber in the USA, Canada and Spain, but now has been repainted in double sunrise colours to commemorate this special part of the Qantas story. The museum was fantastic, full of information, history and you got to climb all around the planes. There didn't seem to be anything off limits. Definitely worth the money. We spent a whole day here. Next time on You'll Go Wild, we head to Tambo and watch the rodeo. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and share.